I do remember about it is after we left it, we came back to the house, uh, decided we'd come up here to fish uh, the line fence pool for a while. And so I remember he, he had had a pair of, uh, of uh, sandals for his waders because uh, he needed something that's very slippery, you know. So he put those on and we wandered up here to, to uh, from the house to, uh, to the line fence pool to fish. And the river was not really high, but it was, it was, uh, it was some, something you had to be pretty careful of. And, and uh, he was telling me that there's a whole big string of rock, big rocks there at one place, and uh, across the river from that and somewhat down, you could see the break where a couple of other big rocks had formed. And uh, he said, if you could get a fly in between those rocks, he says, almost a sure place to get a steelhead. And of course, it, you know, you'd have to, be, but to reach it, you had to wade out beyond this row of rig rocks, which I, something I would never have done. But he did. He went out there about 10 or 12 feet beyond the, beyond the lower rock. He had a cast, I, I think, nearly 100 feet from that point to reach those two rocks. But he caught a steelhead there, first cast. You know, it was, uh, <laughs> I have fished that often, but I've never, never tried wading beyond that rock. That, that, because it's really swift water, and uh, uh, I have managed at some times with a, with a pretty good sized rod, getting a, a fly just about to it, but not where you need to get it, right between the rocks, you know. And so I have never done the same, but it was inter interesting because he, he told me that uh, that he had had fished fished that way on several occasions, and had taken steelhead in in that one place. Once he reached that spot, but he had to wade in a pretty dangerous water to do it. Another occasion when we were over on the gold, we were fishing a place that was called uh, oh. Spur 10, I believe. And there was a little short logging spur went in on uh, uh, on a flat area of there where they'd been logging. But when you went down the hill to to uh, the river itself, there was this great huge pool that uh, made on a bend there. And actually, we'd started from up river a ways and and got and worked down to it. And I was at the upper end of the pool, and Rod was back, and and uh, he said to me, he said, I just saw a fish uh, on the other side there show. He said, why don't you go for, try it? So I did try it, and I, as far as I could cast, I was still 10 feet short, I'm sure, of, of where it was, because the, the water was well marked in that place. You, you could uh, you could see the swiftness of the of the river as it came around, but there was this break and and uh, little wavelets all along this edge and so on. This is right where he'd seen the fish uh, surface. And <clears throat> so after I had my chance, I told him, I said to him, you know, to have a try at it. So what he did, he caught the fish. And I have the picture of him fighting it, yeah. But it was a matter of, well, in that case, it was a matter of actually seeing the fish, but uh, it was in, in it, it showed, the fish showed in a place that, that 
you would recognize as being holding water for for a resting fish. Uh, I met uh, I met the Hague Browns in 1954, and uh, I was on Vancouver Island for a week only in early July. And I had the audacity to go to the house to ask uh, Rod to sign uh, my copy of the Western Angler. And he, actually, he was very gracious, and and so was Anne at the time, although I didn't see much of her after she opened the door and, and accepted me. But uh, but uh, he, he was... He, uh, you know, thinking back, I know he was extremely gracious because he wasn't really a person who uh, you couldn't help but interrupt something. And yet he made you feel very comfortable. And I think that was one of, the, one of Rod's great strengths, is making, making a person feel comfortable even though they're a complete stranger. That if, you know, that have stopped at this house there. I mean, everybody knows he was a fine writer. What probably, I certainly, I think everybody who's ever met him knows he was a very generous man with his time. And that he had a way of really making you comfortable with him. And it doesn't, didn't matter no matter, like, because uh, I, I had spent a fair amount of time with him, and uh, sometimes we would be talking about something uh, that that would be uh, something which required considerable knowledge to understand deeply, which he seemed to always have and could talk to you about it and not make you feel that you didn't know anything. <laughs> I mean, it's just that way. You know, I never felt uncomfortable with Rod at any time, any time at all. So, I, you know, uh, I think those two things particularly strike me in terms of character that uh, uh, he could bring, he could make you in his writings, he would he, he 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 make you almost live what he was doing, but somehow bringing the things of interest that you do into it as well. And the other thing was, is in his presence, you know, it was just always this feeling of that. This feeling that you were never being talked down to, no matter how great the difference in understandings were. Almost always when, when Rod was discussing anything in the matter of conservation, environment, and so on, he had a, quite a, an extensive background of the best science available on that subject at the time. And uh, he, he would draw on that. He would draw on that. When, if that happened before he came to North America, I don't know. But one thing I do remember, because I read his diaries. Anne gave me his diary shortly after he died. And uh, I wish I'd taken more notes of, of them, but uh, one thing that I remember, he uh, when he was going to Charter House, and in a course, in one of the courses that he that he was taken, he was to write a, a an essay on some current event. I can't remember who the prime minister was at the time that he was writing about, whether it was a living prime minister of the day, or whether it might have been a recent one. And it, it had to do with this prime minister's choice of uh, uh, 
of policy on this subject. And apparently Rod had written what he thought about it and turned it in. And what he got back from the master who he did this for was a, a, a little comment. And I, I can tell you essentially what it said, but not word for word. It said essentially that he didn't agree with Rod, but he sure had a good way of writing it. Now he was, you know, essentially about at a high school level, you know, probably 15 or 16 years old. But he sure had a good way of writing it. Mm -hmm. Mentioned the quality of the writing, although he didn't think too much of the quality of his thinking. <laughs> One of the things that uh, has always impressed me about Ron it was that so much of his really good understandings occurred at such a young age. Like the Western Angler, you know, has some wonderful uh, expressions of conservation in it, and he wrote that in 1938. He was 30 years old when he wrote that. It was good enough that some universities had used the Western Angler as part of the uh, as part of their uh, courses in wildlife management. At 30 years old, I was hopeless compared to that. You know, his main purpose in 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 life was to write, and that because he liked fishing, he liked to write about fishing. And, uh, you know, so many, <clears throat> especially if you read the uh, hunting and fishing magazines, most of the stories in there are not by writers. They're not written well enough. And, uh, but there are people who fish first and then want to write about it. So they're not, they're not just people who want to be a writer, they, they're, they just happen to want to be an authority. <laughs> I think that's the main thing. So much of the stuff that's that's written is pretty bad. For anybody who spends that much time out on rivers and so on, you can't help but understand the river and this, the surroundings of it far better than a person who doesn't. And, and you, you see that today, too, with anyone who really is out there for something besides uh, egotistically a, a catch a fish, but who, who has some, some idea that, uh, that they're, they're, they're part of, a, of a, a system of living things. And... Uh, you start to, you know, you start to become uh, so acquainted with them that you you begin you begin to sort of love them. That's what it amounts to, and when and when things don't go right for them, and especially if it's done through some man-made uh, actions and so on, you start taking exceptions to those things, and I, I'm sure that. That would be the, the case with Rod. That uh, he was, he was very, very observant. He was quite a conservationist, no doubt about that. Probably long before it became very popular to be one. That uh, because he always seemed to understand connections between things, and and had uh, uh, the. Uh, foresight, he had the foresight to see what can ha what what could result from certain actions and when and uh, when so often what he was what he was up against was uh, was was people or government which are people, of course, uh, 
looking at things like they were seeing it through a tunnel. There was only one thing that they were focusing in on. And any other, uh, any other considerations that, that uh, should have been given to, to the changes that they were, they were bringing about were just not even considered. And, and that, of course, would be especially where you're destroying uh, something of, of nature, something maybe of beauty, something of value, like the Pacific salmon and so on. The uh, I I think that the, what, what happened in man in in the bureaucracy of managing uh, fish is that uh, it became polit political that. That uh, for those people who just wanted fish, no matter how they could get them, they would they would put the pressure on the politician. And the politician wouldn't wouldn't know one way or the other. They want fish. That's the easiest way we can get get them for you. And you know that that's the way it is today. For uh, up here at the uh, hatchery here on on the Quinsome, they raise uh, pink salmon to be sent down to Victoria to create a, f uh, a fishery there, something like the one they did at, uh, at the uh, Fisherman's Wharf, you know. And because once these fish are, are put into a certain area, I forget what point it is, but one of the points down there that, uh, uh, that once they're they're put in, this is where they're going to come back to, and with pink salmon, it's certainly they've certainly been successful in terms of numbers, of maintaining numbers, and the reason for that one is that these fish will be back in 2010, <laughs> the year of the Olympics. So what you're trying to do is make an impression with the world, you know, that you've really got fish. Not how you got them. I have no doubt that he'd be concerned with many of the things he was concerned with when he was alive, because they haven't changed. But I think there are new concerns, and... Uh, the the one that comes immediately to mind are fish farms. That uh, yeah, they manufacture fish uh, pretty effectively for these farms, and in the process, seem to be destroying our wild stocks. And here, here again, you have a, a strong science built up that shows this is what is happening. And yet you have a government that's trying to find anything to disprove that. You know, we have this uh, Pacific Salmon Forum that takes place. And they, first of all, what they did was to uh, spend, spend quite a lot of money, hired uh, uh, scientists to make a study to see whether or not the first studies were correct and so on. Essentially, what and I guess they did this to make sure it looked like it, that it would be uh, 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 broad, broadly based, not just uh, not just for those not just those scientists who who might favor fish farms and so on. So they hired Craig Orr, and uh, one of the other scientists was uh, Alexander Morton on that. So they they did a study, and it it just supported what had been done. Well, when when the forum got a hold of this, the fellow in charge, who's the main chairman of it. Uh, John Fraser did his own interpretation. 
And that's where he, and it, it happened at the time that the uh, study that appeared in Science Magazine came out condemning the farms. So he was in a, a kind of a rush to, uh, to have a, re, uh, a rejection of it. So he took and made his own interpretation from the studies of Craig Orr, and uh, it was totally phony, totally phony in it. And he got told so right away by the scientists that did the work that he was off base. So, you know, that ha of course that has passed, and uh, there have been more studies, and they keep building up and so on. Now, there are studies that indicate that you don't have absolute proof. And what is hard to get through with people like politicians that don't understand science at all is that uh, absolutes are almost impossible. And especially with something as uh, as uh, uh, complex as living things. You know, how do you absolutely say that that uh, sea lice have left these fish and attacked these fish? You got to see it. Well, th nobody's going to see anything like that. It's impossible. So you go by the best evidence. And this is the way science works. And this is why there still is science. If it didn't work that way, we'd know everything and have known everything, and there wouldn't be any need for another scientist in this world. But you can't get that through politicians. You just can't. They can't seem to, to fathom that, that, that sort of thing, that uh, you're not going to you're not going to get some absolute answer that never will have a change somewhere in the future. It's, it's the most difficult thing. Well, to get back to Rod, I mean, I, I think he, I think he, he used uh, the best science that was available at the time. And the intelligence is that that's what you make use of because you don't have anything better. That certainly isn't going on today in regards to fish farms, not from the government. No matter how much the science piles up against fish farms, they're still looking for some way to say, well, it isn't the fish farms. What happened in the fisheries branch was, was more political than it was uh, environmental, that the main idea was to provide fish for the great masses of people that wanted them. And quality fishing was not looked upon as any kind of importance to them, as long as there were fish to be caught. So going to, to hatcheries, you can manufacture fish uh, in far greater numbers than nature does. The only thing that's, that does seem to happen, and it certainly has happened here in Campbell River, is that there's a change in the size of the fish, for one thing. And there could be other changes we don't understand. But, uh, uh, and this has happened in hatcheries everywhere that where, where uh, serious hatchery work is de being done to replace natural wild fish, they are inferior. They, get, they tend to become smaller. And why that is, I don't think anyone really understands exactly, but it certainly has happened here with uh, the Chinook salmon. That uh, while I, I give credit to the hatchery that they, pre they, they saved the, uh, the Chinook salmon from becoming extinct, which I think would have happened. I, I think that's not quite the correct word. I think it's called extirpated, meaning they aren't extinct all over the world, but they're extinct in this river. 
And, and that certainly would have happened with the heavy metal pollution of the 1970s that happened. But uh, it, with the hatchery, they did save it. But there has been this, there has been a change in the fish. They are far smaller on average than they used to be. I was guiding uh, out of Painter's Lodge in the 1960s, and uh, even then, they, uh, the size of uh, the Chinooks and that were far greater. And it, it didn't happen that often that the Chinooks you got uh, there at the river mouth were what we what are known as undersized, meaning they're less than 30 pounds. <laughs> strange, strange use of terms there, but uh, uh, today at the, at the Thai club during the Thai season, that two months, that there's probably at least five undersized fish to every one that's over 30 pounds. And and very, only like this last year, only one over 40 pounds, and none larger. And you know, you go back through the records. At one time, there were always quite a few 50 pounders, a few 60, even maybe a 70. You know, but they aren't there anymore. They're gone. And I I don't know. I I suppose when you're uh, When you are bringing about the fertilization of the eggs and sperms from fish, that uh, you're, you're you're somehow changing the genetics the genetics of those fish as compared to what, how the fish would decide who they spawn with, and so on. Ah. Now that's kind of a weird statement, I realize that. Almost anthropomorphizing for the fish, for, nat for the natural fish, but it, uh, there's, there is something there. There certainly is something, because it, it's never the same once you go to hatcheries. And the other thing is, is that there's this I remember that Rod did did bring this up at the time that they were talking about going to hatcheries more, and that that the real danger of the hatchery is is in the 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 belief that you no longer have to look after the rivers. I think everything Rod said had some some backing in research, where where good research had had uh, a very positive effect. Uh, the ones that come to mind immediately, of course, is what was happening to the interior lakes, where uh, the work of uh, Motley, Charles Motley and particularly Motley, and some of the others that uh, uh, where they were where they were controlling the number of and these were primarily wild fish in the lakes to the extent where where the lakes could provide a maximum uh, of a certain size of fish, uh, and that work was done on Paul Lake. And uh, if you and it, uh, there was another lake nearby, where where uh, it, originally it had been uh, uh, what was called uh, uh, God. It was a lake without fish, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it had a tremendous larder there of fish food. 
because it was a lake without fish. And when they put fish in it, they grew into these enormous sizes. You know, they were up in the teens and that sort of thing. Trout up in the teens. And uh, so what they did, thinking at the time, that well, this is a big fish lake. We can put more in, which they did put more in. And all of a sudden, the sizes came down. In other words, there was a... Uh, there was this matter of carrying capacity that was not fully understood, but was certainly coming to be understood very, very well by uh, Charles Motley's work. And uh, I don't know that anyone has, uh, has duplicated anything like that on coastal rivers. And I'm not sure quite how you go about it, but what he, what he is, is uh, implying there is that, that, uh, that the waters that fish, fish are using do have a carrying capacity. Rod divided up sport fishermen among three groups. One he called simply meat fishermen. The other one was people who who liked to fish but didn't find it a necessary part of their life. They, it was just an interesting thing to do, like going to a movie or going to a, a football game or whatever. And then there was the group who, the third group, who, uh, where fishing became so much a part of your life that that this was almost an essential thing for you to do. And in 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 separating these three groups, he's talk. He then talks about how how do you manage a fishery with those three groups? Well, first of all, you don't worry about the meat fishermen. You don't do anything for them. They'll get their meat one way or another. For the second group, you don't have to do anything because they're satisfied with far less. But if you manage for the third group, the other two are going to be looked after. So there's a, there is this dichotomy in, in sport fishing that uh, this dichotomy of, of why you go fishing. And I, this is one of the good things about Rod Rod's writings is when you read it, you know why you go fishing, not just how you how to do it when you get there, or 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 not just where to go, but why you're going. That's the thing that just is so missing in, by in so much of the writing today. I think he'd be concerned about the Quinsome, the coal mine at, up the Quinsome because. Uh, uh, the coal mine has been uh, responsible for uh, releasing sulfates into the river, and these sulfates have been bringing about uh, the a great decline, a big decline in the uh, river, the natural river biota that provides the food for fish that are living in the river and. Uh, uh, it, that has that has been shown now to have that all the way down to the the camel itself that the uh, the uh, uh, oh, crustaceans and insects and so on have been are, are way down in numbers and the important thing about that is to the uh, fish who spend some time in fresh water before they go out. They have, to, they have to feed during that time. Coho require a full year in fresh water. Steelhead, two years. And with that loss of, of food and so on, uh, it's, it, you can't really expect that river to ever really recover 
with those two species, they could <clears throat> they can still do a pretty good job of uh, of raising pink salmon in there, and a fairly recent job of a decent job of of uh, raising chinooks because they don't remain in fresh water uh, too long either, up to two or three months maybe. But with coho and and uh, and steelhead, which have such a long period in fresh water, there's there's not much chance of them ever recovering in the Quinsome with that coal mine situation. And they haven't been able to solve it. They have looked and they have tried to find out where is this coming from, but they don't know. So it, it continues on. And now, of course, there's been these deposits of uh, arsenic up in uh, Long Lake, which is a which has a tributary that flows directly into, into the Quinsome. Now, as long as they remain inactive <clears throat> in the bottoms where they're, where they're uh, uh, collecting, uh, I shouldn't say they, uh, the arsenic remains there, uh, there's no danger. But the danger comes from a certain bacterium that if it ever begins to work on the, uh, on the uh, arsenic itself, it starts a reaction that there's no solution to how to stop it. And that means the, the virtual loss of the whole river eventually, including, including the uh, hatchery.